for good old time's sake, at the end I will give you a short exam. So <laughs> be prepared. So I will start by telling you about the state of the universe as we see it today. Okay? This will be current data all the way to you know, a few months old. And it will be striking. The second one is I'm going to lead with these observations to cosmological puzzles, two of them. And then from these two cosmological puzzles, I will talk about what string theory, the subject I specialize in, has to say about it. And you would think it would answer the questions, but unfortunately, it will create a crisis. And that's the crisis known as the anthropic principle. So that's how we will end, and it's a physical as well as philosophical discussion. So hopefully lots of questions will be generated. So let's start by a view of the state of the universe as we know it. I'll go quickly over it since you guys are familiar with the universe. So here's the Earth. This is a simulator, an actual simulator. And it's showing the Earth at a faster rate, but otherwise pretty genuine. So I want to remind you that light travels at finite speed. You do remember that from your childhood probably, <laughs> but just in case you forgot, I'm going to look at the sun, and please don't do that, but here is the sun. And I want you to look in the lower left corner here as I measure the distance to the sun. And you will see a time flash out. Light travel time, eight minutes, 23 seconds. So every time you look at the sun, you're seeing it about eight minutes ago in the past. Because light takes time to travel, there's a time lag. So when you look deeper into space, the further back in time you look it. So the sun, as, as we image it at any instant in time, is eight minutes old. We can never find out the sun as it is exactly right now. Eight minutes isn't much, so let's look at a planet. Tell me your favorite planet. Already, so. <laughs> So here's Saturn in the center, and now I will measure the distance to Saturn. So lower left corner, one hour, 12 minutes. So as we image Saturn, it's about an hour old. So let's go to Saturn. This, this uh, simulation allows me to break all the laws of physics, so I will be able to quickly travel to Saturn. Here's Saturn. <laughs> and uh, it actually uses satellite imagery to render. You see the moons going around it, it's pretty cool. And uh, so that's about an hour old data from around us. I can now see some familiar faces from my early days at Harvey Mudd. So. so, okay, so that's about an hour old looking into space. Tell me your favorite star. Okay, uh, I will have, <laughs> I will have to spell it though. Let's see, I will try. Oh, here, it's actually telling me how to spell it. <laughs> okay, let's look at Betelgeuse. Here it is, it's a bit reddish, if you notice. Not in this lighting though. And uh, there's a camera here, on top of it there's a glass for what? Do you drink from that glass? <laughs> okay, look at the distance from this. Okay, lower left corner. 497 years. That's around when you probably graduated from <laughs> Harry Mudd. So, so whenever we look at Betelgeuse, it's about 500 years old, okay? You see, we're looking back in time, literally when we look into the dark space. Okay, that's still pretty lame. 500 years isn't much, okay? So I'm going to pick some other object from the sky I don't know if you've seen or you've noticed this, but usually you need to be in countryside where it's pretty dark. Then you may start noticing that some of the light sources in the sky, the point light sources, they're not very sharp, they're a bit fuzzy. And in the city light environment, you may not notice that, but there's lots of them. 
in the countryside, you will distinguish fuzzy stars. So I'm going to focus on one of those and brace yourself now. So I'm going to focus on something called M33. So I'll center on it. Here it is. I'm not sure if you see, it is a bit fuzzy in the center. That's how you would see it if lighting levels are good. Now I'm going to measure the distance to it. So how old is this fuzzy light source when we look at it? Are you ready? Okay, you may want to hold hands here. <laughs> so 2.8 million years. So when we're looking at objects like this, we see them 2.8 million years ago because of the time lapse. Okay, so you say that's pretty cool. Let's look even deeper into space. Let me switch back to the transparencies. And uh, that object that we saw, that fuzzy object 2.8 million, 2 million years ago or so, is a galaxy. So here's how it would look like with higher resolution. And you may remember that a galaxy is a collection of billions and billions of stars. And these stars are swirling around. This is a spiral formation, which is typical. It's basically like a toilet. It's flushing down. In the center of the galaxy, we now know that there typically is a black hole. A star which has collapsed, its typical mass is several million or billion solar masses. A single star whose weight is millions or billions times the weight of the sun. It has immense gravitational pull, and it's sucking all the stars around it. And that light in the center you see is the scream from the stars as they're being eaten by the black hole. So, so let me go back to the simulation. And again, breaking the laws of physics, I will travel to this galaxy, the M33. And here it is. It looks like a spiral galaxy, typically. And now I'm going to look back at our own galaxy, which is called the what? Milky the Milky Way. You see, you did learn your classes. So here's looking back at our galaxy, of course. It is 2.8 million years away. And I'll travel to it. And uh, as we travel closer to it, you'll notice that our Milky Way, you won't notice anything because of the lighting condition. Let me check. You can't see anything, can you? OK, so believe me, it's a spiral galaxy. And uh, sorry? OK, let me turn off the light, but I'm not sure if the camera people will be happy. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, but then camera people are probably never happy. <laughs> I, I have no clue how to do this. Ah, here. Is this helping? OK. Why? Are you going to beat me up or something? <laughs> which, which door? This one? Okay. Okay, so so this is a spiral galaxy, just like the one I just showed you. Imagine it's a spiral galaxy. It's our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And just like typical galaxies, there is a huge black hole at the center, and we're spiraling into it. In a few billion years we'll reach it and we'll be sucked into the black hole. Okay? So we are sorry? It is bad news, but you know most of our students would be graduated by then. So, <laughs> so we will probably Harvey Mudd will probably will still have financial problems in a few billion years. So, so the the center of our galaxy has a black hole. We're spiraling into it. This is a very generic scenario. We're very typical in the universe in this sense. So the, the black hole being so massive is attracting everything into it. We're all being around it, but there are interactions between the stars among themselves, as well as gravitational radiation, which is a much lesser effect. So, so basically, the stars are made of gases. And the galaxy itself, you can think of as sort of some 
fluid which is spiraling, and the stars are the constituents of this fluid. And fluids have frictional effect coming from the interactions among the stars. Okay. So that's a great question. We're spiraling in, and eventually we'll reach the black hole. Okay. So let me go back to the slides. So this is a galaxy, a typical galaxy. And now you say, why don't I look even deeper into space? I'll pick a patch of sky which look basically dark to the naked eye, but I'll point the Hubble telescope toward it and collect lots of light so that I see very faint objects. So here's a picture from the Hubble galaxy of what you would see if you collect enough light. So you see, oh, there's more stars, but not really. Because every single dot you see in this picture is a galaxy. And there's billions and billions of them. Each point light source in this picture contains itself billions of galaxies with a black hole at its center. So the immensity, the scale of this is mind boggling. So the sky is filled with billions of galaxies, much like us, each one with black holes in it typically. And this is the, the state of our universe about two to three billion years in the past. So we're looking deeper into space, hence further back in time. And by the time we reach this picture, we're several billions old. They're all spinning. They have all kinds of dynamics amongst themselves. Sometimes these galaxies even collide. It's quite frequent. And collisions of galaxies are extremely beautiful. I could have showed you some pictures, but I don't have time. We have very high resolution pictures of colliding galaxies, how they tear each other apart as they go through each other. So it's very dynamical, yes. I don't think so. I mean, within, within I don't think so, no. <laughs> it would be quite something if they do. But I mean, they're oriented in all different ways. So depending where you're looking at it, it's spinning in whatever direction you want. So, <laughs> so now, you say that's pretty cool. But that's about 2 billion years imaging of the universe. 2 million billion years in the past. Now, what if I pick a small black spot here and look even deeper into space with even more powerful instruments? What would I see? And now we're coming to data which is only a few years old. So I will now show you what we see if we try to probe as far as we can into the past. And I'll switch back to the simulation, and I'll go back home otherwise known as the sun. So we'll travel back into our solar system from the galaxy. You can't see anything, but here's the sun. That much you hopefully can see. So here's our neighborhood, you see? This is our neighborhood. The Earth is hanging around in this local neighborhood of the sun. So I'm going to project onto this picture now actual data of what is seen at the edge of our observation as deep into space as possible. So I'm going to flip a switch here and show you a picture and then explain. OK, brace yourself. Here it is. So this is how the universe really looks like if we look as far back in time as possible. What you're seeing in this false coloring is the temperature of a plasma at the beginning of time, almost at the beginning of time. Blue areas are colder, yellow, red areas are hotter. So I'm not sure how well you can see this, but you see there's all kinds of patterns. The size of a typical hot spot in the sky is about the size of the moon to the naked eye. We can't see this with the naked eye because it's actually microwave uh, range. So you need instruments to detect microwaves. I'll show you, however, a full map of it. Well, let me skip ahead. I missed out on things and show you a full map of it. So this is the full map of what is known as the cosmic microwave background radiation. 
This is the latest data. And what it is, is basically a primordial gas from which we're all made of about 13.7 billion years ago. That's the age of the universe as we know it. And it's surrounding us in every direction. And it's glowing. It's about 3,000 degrees Kelvin. By the time the radiation reaches our, our epoch, it's about 3 degrees Kelvin. And these fluctuations that you're seeing are tiny fluctuations in temperature of this primordial gas. It's basically the goo that we are made of. When this picture was imaged, the New York Times published it, and the title was something about imaging the face of God. Because this is as close to saying something like that can go. This is basically an image of the beginning of our time. A tiny fluctuation here, maybe, eventually evolves into a star, gets part of a galaxy, maybe into a planet, and then one of you will be there. So this is basically an image of our past. So now, let me go back. I skipped ahead a bit, but I'll go back to this image which is about two, three billion years ago, and point out another very interesting observation, which happened about 30 years ago, but we've learned a great deal about more recently. If you look at every point light source here, a galaxy, you can find out that it's actually moving away from us. You know this already, the universe is expanding. The entire sort of star field that you see is moving away from us at various speeds. And this movement away from us is a reflection of space itself expanding violently. So if you want to image this in cartoonish way, here's a grid line of, on a patch of space. And imagine these two blue dots are two galaxies. And they are a certain distance apart. And what's happening is that the fabric of space itself is stretching and expanding. So that a bit later, the distance between galaxies ex becomes bigger. And that's what we're seeing, an expanding universe. Now you say, when was this found out? Well, about 30, 40 years ago. But here's the new interesting aspect of it. 30, 40 years ago, cosmologists who would say the universe is expanding were most of the time uh, laughed at because it's usually fun to laugh at cosmologists. <laughs> but no more, because cosmologists used to quote error bars which are of three, four hundred, one thousand percent order. And this is what has happened over the years. The left picture is a graph of the speed of a galaxy versus distance some 30 years ago. And this is the picture around these times. So you see, now we can't make fun of cosmologists anymore. They know what they're talking about. In fact, cosmology currently, observational cosmology, you could say, is in golden age. And it has become a precision science, quoting measurements of the order of 1% error. So the universe is expanding. Nobody can dispute that anymore. So, so far, what do we know? The universe is expanding. We have measurements of it. If we look as far back in time as we can, we see we are surrounded, surrounded by a glowing primordial plasma from which we all originated. And we can measure the temperature fluctuations in this plasma. And this was the picture of the plasma we just looked at. Any questions so far? I'm about to lead to the puzzles, and things will get crazier and crazier. Now, before that, here's an overview of what's happening. This is time horizontally. And here's the story that I just told you in pictures, repeated chronologically. At some early times, about 14 billion years ago, there was a random quantum fluctuations, which 
basically created the primordial plasma, which went through a violent expansion, which you could call an explosion, if you want. And then, as the universe expanded, the temperature in the universe started cooling down. It started at 10 to the two, 32 degrees Kelvin, and within about 300,000 years, it was down to 3,000 degrees Kelvin. Around this temperature, the plasma started going to a phase transition, atoms formed. Nuclei started capturing electrons, and you formed atoms. Atoms are neutral. Hence, light goes through a gas of atoms. So what happened was, at this 300,000 year line, something very interesting, the primordial plasma went from opaque to transparent to light. So when we're looking back into time, the last thing we can see is the face of the plasma that is opaque. We can't see through it because light can't penetrate. So this 300,000 line, 300,000 year line, after the beginning of time, is the cosmic microwave background radiation, the picture I showed you, the color for blue, blue, green, whatever. After this, the universe is transparent, and we can see through the material, and we can image stars, galaxies, all the way to where we are now. So when we started this sort of presentation, we were here, we looked back at Sun, Saturn, etc. A few billion years back, we looked at M M33 galaxy, and then all the way to 12.7 billion years ago, and that was the cosmic background radiation, and we have no hope of seeing past that with light only because this plasma is opaque. Does it make a bit of sense so far? So that's sort of the story, whether you like it or not. This is <laughs> observation. I still haven't told you anything up to interpretation or physics or any sort of dispute. This is hardcore data. We have to accept it. Cosmologists now measure these things within a percent error. And we have to accept whatever we're taught, however crazy it is. And notice that throughout this history, the hallmark of this process is this expansion of space. It goes through some violent expansion initially, and then the expansion slows down. But here, you see that this curve even curves more. And that is because our current data shows that our expansion is accelerating. Yes? Yes, that is, a, that is like one of the funnest aspects of it. So let me explain it again. So imagine the primordial goo that the universe was made of. All the energy the universe was made of, it was a bunch of quarks and particles all messed up together in some sort of very hot plasma. And this sub substance, light cannot penetrate. It is opaque. So that's how the universe was filled by, that's what the universe was filled by at the beginning of time. As the universe expands, it cools down. As it cools down, the constituents of this hot plasma undergo different stages of phase transition, much like water becoming ice or evaporating. They change structural form. At about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, the beginning of time, this transition reaches the temperature low enough that atoms can form. As soon as atoms can form, the plasma becomes a substance where, which light can go through. And, and the universe, by emitting any form of radiation? Any form, any form of radiation. Well, any, any form of photonic radiation, light of different wavelengths. That's an extremely good question, because then you say, can we ever see past that wall that we're surrounded by? And the, uh, question, the answer is yes, but not with light. The primary tool for it is gravitational radiation. So gravitational radiation can go through it, and that's why we're building multi-million dollar instrument trying to look behind the, basically, for some reason, we're obsessed about finding about the beginning of time.
So we're not happy enough that we can see the, you know, up to 300,000 years. So now I'm going to start, ex yes, go ahead. So, so that, so, so there, there was an asymmetry in the beginning of time, which created a preponderance of matter over antimatter. So, at some point, all the matter antimatter that could cancel each other canceled and generated radiation. But there was still some leftover matter from this. Yes, it's sort of we understand it to the extent that we don't understand it fundamentally. But we understand it to the extent that we know the cause of the asymmetry is something particular in the equations of physics. But we don't understand it in a philosophically deep sense why it's there. It's like asking why a certain symmetry exists in nature. I will come back to this issue in a moment. OK, so now I'm going to start explaining what we know from physics about this and how we understand it. And this is when the puzzle starts arising. Everything up to now was observation. What we know from physics is the following. There's two kinds of stuff that you can have that has energy. One is matter, either luminous or dark. That's what we're made of. We're made of matter. And matter gravitates, meaning it tries to lump together. That's why the Earth pulls on us. That's why the Earth itself has formed a rock, which is spherical. So matter clumps together because of gravity. That's familiar. You did this. I don't know if you had physics 23, but no, I pre you probably didn't do it in physics 23. Physics 24, I don't know. OK. The second type of matter you have not learned, the second type of energy in the universe you have not learned at Harvey Mudd unless you were a physics major. And that is dark energy understood relatively more recently. And dark energy is a form of energy which we understand in sort of quantum mechanical qualitative way. And we understand that it actually anti-gravitates. Instead of clumping together, it tends to create a repulsive force. Okay. So now let's do the chemistry of the universe. How much of all this stuff is in the universe? So 4% is normal luminous matter, the stuff we're made of. 26% is matter, but of the dark kind. We can't see it with light, but we know it's there because of its gravitational effect on other matter which has light. For, well, a black hole could be uh, part of what dark matter is, but not everything that dark matter is. There's other candidates. It's all exotic, but not too exotic. This will not, I mean, understanding dark matter will not lead to losing your sanity. <laughs> However, speaking of losing your sanity, the rest, 70% of the universe, is made of this dark energy stuff, which is anti gravitating. This is why the universe is expanding. Dark energy creates a repulsive effect. The space time is stretching violently because it's filled by dark energy. We cannot ignore this. These numbers are within a percent error bars. So we know it's there. So you say, OK, we understand qualitatively the existence of these three components. It's very disturbing that most of the stuff in the universe is something that we have no clue about. But you ask yourself how much you don't have a clue about this dark energy. Well, from quantum mechanics, you can understand dark energy as an anti-gravitating form of energy by the following simple thought experiment. 
if you take a box of empty vacuum, go somewhere very far away, away from the Earth, where there's total void, pick a box, one meter by one meter, one, mi one meter, it's totally void, it's vacuum. If you weigh it, quantum mechanically, it will have a weight. Because there's no such thing quantum mechanically as emptiness, at the microscopic scale, vacuum is really like a soup of particles which is constantly boiling. And it has some average energy density. This is what dark energy is. So experimental cosmologists have recently measured the density of dark energy, the 70% of the stuff, very accurately. Here's the number, this is experiment. 10 to the power minus eight Earth per centimeter cube. It's known more accurately than just an order of magnitude, but that's good enough for us. Now you say, go to the theoretical physicist, ask them to compute the energy density in a box of emptiness. Let's compare experiment versus theory. Remember, you used to do that. <laughs> and you got 10, 20, 30% error in the lab. Sometimes you got 50, 100% error, you had to redo the lab or something. <laughs> so when we do this, this is the theoretical prediction. <laughs> it's not working, is it? We, <laughs> that's what I said. <laughs> so it is safe to say that within the traditional framework of physics, we have no clue what dark energy is. That's puzzle number one. Now I'll give you a second puzzle, which is shorter to phrase, but even more disturbing. So here's a timeline. And remember, if we go back in time, here's about 300,000 years after time equals zero, where we see the cosmic microwave background wall. And here it is where you are. Now I'm going to plot on this energy densities. First, the energy density as a function of time of dark energy. Well, dark energy is the property of vacuum. Its energy density does not change. It's a flat curve. Now matter, on the other hand, as the space expands, there's a fixed amount of matter in it. The volume becomes bigger. The density goes down. So on a logarithmic scale, I will draw the evolution of matter density as a function of time. Do you, notice, do you notice a coincidence? So this is where we have 70, 30 percent. That's around the era where we're living. Now this is a logarithmic scale. This is many, many orders of magnitude on both the x and y axis. So you say, how big is this coincidence? So you can put it in some statistical quantitative way. And I sort of tried to do it in a way that maybe is most accessible to a public audience. So not you, since you're not a public audience, but so here's, here's a way I can estimate this coincidence, how bad of a coincidence it is. If every single person on this planet would buy a lottery ticket, and one of the people will win the lottery ticket, if I get the winning ticket for three days in a row, that's equivalent to this coincidence. <laughs> okay, so what the heck is happening? We seem to be living in some amazingly special epoch in the cosmological history of the universe, where dark energy density is competing with matter energy density. Now, the physics of everything in this blue shaded region on the right is very well understood. But as you go back in time to the cosmic micro background wall or beyond, the framework of physics that we have starts faltering. And we know that independent of these things. So the red region, which is to the left of this diagram, 
is where our knowledge becomes flaky. But this coincidence is happening here, and it's also sensitive to the beginning of time. And if you want to say, what if I use physics that can be understood throughout this timeline, then you would need a subject like string theory to do that. So I told you two puzzles so far, and I'm going to now tell you how these puzzles get addressed in a subject like string theory, which is a framework of modern physics that attempts to unify quantum mechanics and gravitational physics. So I'm going to give you in one slide a brief review of what string theory says about these two puzzles. And at first you're going to feel a great deal of joy because these puzzles seem to be solved. But then we're going to lead into a very disturbing conclusion. <laughs> My pleasure. <coughs> so string theory gives you the mother of all equations. Imagine one equation that basically tells you everything, unifies all of physics. We know this equation. And this mother of all equations, presumably, you would solve it. And then the solution would be our universe. This is not some tiny problem like from your mechanics exam. This is the grand problem of all of physics. So mother of all equations, solve it. The solution is our universe. We can do a lot of these things, these steps, and get an idea where this will lead us. So let's say we find a solution, and some people have found some solution, and this is a universe. And we look at the parameters of this universe, such as the density of dark energy and things like that, the mass of the electron, whatever. And we find out, well, maybe the dark energy density is not very close to what we measure, but it's not 10 to the, 100, one, 10 to the power 122 either. So it's getting better. But you look at these equations and you notice that they have more than one solution. So another person finds another solution, so that's another universe. In this universe, the parameters are pretty close to what we see around us. So you start getting excited. But then your competing uh, scientist finds another solution which is even better in terms of predicting the stuff around us. Yet another one a bit off, and then another one, and another one. And you soon you realize these equations have possibly millions, possibly infinite number of solutions. One of them is our universe. It's an embarrassment of riches. <laughs> you have the mother of all equations. It can generate a solution that looks like the word, potentially like the word we see with the correct density of dark energy, et cetera. But which one is it? Which one of the infinite many solutions do we find as our universe? You lose predictive power. You have no way of predicting at this point. This mother of all equations is not telling you anything. So now I'm going to sort of uh, go into a story which is related to the title of the talk. And this is originally due to the cosmologist Linde about 15 years ago, I believe. But I'm going to rephrase it in a modern way and put it in the context of string theory. And it's the, it's the fish in a pond parable, if you want. So imagine. There's a pond where there in it some species of fish, like the pond outside. And these fish are some special species of koi, which can live in 73.2 degrees Fahrenheit water. Okay. So these, these are good fish, presumably tasty as well, but over millions of years, these fish evolve and they become sentient. 
and they start doing math and physics. So at some point, some of them go on into you know lucrative careers in business and you know whatever, but others decide to devote their lives to dead ends such as physics and mathematics. <laughs> and those who go into physics at some point develop a thermometer. You know, they get the Fish Nobel Prize or whatever. <laughs> and then they measure the temperature of the water and they find out it's 72.3 degrees Fahrenheit. So all the experimental fish physicists run to the theoretical fish physicists who are usually in the corner in the pond. And they tell them, can you write some equations that can predict this temperature? And the theoretical physicist starts working very hard, write down string theory and things like that. Meanwhile, you're standing on the edge of the pond and you're looking inside to this fish and you're thinking that these are the stupidest animals ever. <laughs> because they're trying to predict or make a big fundamental deal out of the temperature of the water, which if it was different, they wouldn't have evolved as fish in that water. There's nothing fundamental about that temperature value. It is special to that species of the fish. Their presence in the water has altered the reality so that the water temperature is of no fundamental physical significance. Their existence makes it special but no physical law makes it special. So they should never be able to write a physical equation of a fundamental nature that can predict this temperature. So think of the temperature as, for example, the density of dark energy. So what does this mean? This is known the anthropic principle from anthropology. It suggests that perhaps there are some things around us, some observations around us that we should never be able to predict. They are so because we exist. So are we special in some way? Is that coincidence, cosmological coincidence we sort of pointed out, indicating a certain special attribute of our time and our, of our existence? Perhaps in one of the other universes, which is a solution of the mother of all equations, life could not have evolved. Nobody would be around to ask these deep questions. So does this mean that some questions cannot be self-consistently posed? Which means that physics has an endpoint, at least fundamental physics. So this is somewhat of a philosophical crisis the anthropic principle is accepted and adopted by many theoretical physicists in the last few years, but many others also find it extremely disturbing. It has a flavor of the Middle Ages. Do not ask certain questions. There are no answers to it. We're special. We're at the center of the universe. There are alternatives to it, but I won't go into it. I'm probably already close to, well, I still have some time for questions. So let me wrap it up here and then go into questions and I can discuss more based on what you ask me. Okay, questions. I, sh I should have had an applause sign flash. <laughs> okay, questions about this or beyond. Is there a known reason to believe that our existence as we are should depend on uh, the level of matter and dark energy being comparable? Yes, there is a certain sort of, uh, uh, th there are certain reasonable arguments that you could put in into an anthropic argument. For example, you could say that if there was too much dark energy, since dark energy anti-gravitates, then the expansion of the universe would be too violent for matter to collapse and form stars and planets. 
So in that sense, if you cannot form planets in such a scenario, how can you have life, you would say? So on the other hand, if you have too much matter and too little dark energy, then you could have things collapse quickly and not have enough time for evolution to develop into a sentient life form. So some of these arguments sound sensible enough, but it's still disturbing in the sense that if you want any details, then you have to start answering questions like, what does it exactly take to form a sentient creature in, and how much time do you need for it? And what is then a sentient creature? And you know, what kind of form does it have? Does it have to be having two legs and two whatever? It can, yes, the, de the devil is in the details, yes. To follow up on that, how accurate is that? When you, when you pointed out that we were at this coincidence point. The, how accurate is that? Well, the best way I know how to quantify that is through that coincidence argument I gave you. The coincidence that, that we live in this era is the three-time winning lottery ticket thing. The expansion of space-time is a violent event. Is, is that something that we can detect here on Earth, or is that something that's going on at like, the edge of the observable universe? So the, the initial, initial 13 billion years ago, the initial formation of that sort of random fluctuation in energy that started everything, time equals zero, had a huge amount of dark energy in it. And that dark energy drove an expansion which is extremely violent. It's explosive, literally. In a, in a tiny, tiny fraction of a second, the universe expands many, many of orders of magnitude. But then, once matter gets created from the energy in the universe, the expansion slows down. And it goes from an exponential expansion to a power law expansion, which still continues to expand. If you remember that graph I showed you, it's an explosive expansion and then it slows down after that. And currently, we are entering a stage of exponential expansion because dark energy density is more than matter energy density. So there's different uh, levels of violence in the expansion of the universe depending on what time you are living in. And currently, it's moderate. In fact, there's a, there's a scenario where you could try to project into the future. You say, okay, how does the expansion of the universe is to evolve from now on? And of course, it is speculative because you, you, you do not know enough to do this projection. But one scenario, which is really cool, is that as the dark energy proportion continues to grow over the matter energy density, then the expansion will accelerate more and more. It's an exponential expansion. So what will happen is that the matter that has clumped together will start coming apart. So first galaxies will start to unravel. Then solar systems so will start to unravel. Planets will not have enough gravity to hold back with the sun because the dark energy will be pushing it back. And so at some point in time, you could be walking down the street and you would see Saturn fly by. So, so basically everything would unravel at the end of the you know, time. Earth itself could not hold itself together and would disintegrate. So that's one scenario. Again, you still have some time.